You know, to me, winning is just pursuit of your talent and of your potential, being interested, being curious, being alert, being responsive, and always being humble, hungry, and coachable. speak a tremendous amount about prey drive in fact prey drive is what really caught my attention when i started following you which was about two years ago uh, we have a bunch of mutual friends and somebody had mentioned you one day in conversation and so i pay attention to what i hear and if i hear something one time then that's okay it sparks my interest second time i need to pay attention third time i'm like well there's a pattern and i'd heard your name come up three different times and so i started to, to search you and there you were speaking about prey drive and prey drive really speaks directly to my heart because I think that that is something that is innate in every single one of us. We're not always aware of it. Would you mind just speaking a little bit into what is prey drive? How did you come up with the concept of prey drive? And why is it something that everybody should be aware of, especially inside of business? Well, prey drive is your instinctual ability to see something with the eyes optically or in the mind, in the imagination, and to have the persistence and the intensity to pursue it. Prey drive is prevalent in animals. Uh, I heard a person talk about prey drive in an animal and I thought, boom, I thought, man, I think humans have a prey drive. So I took the concept, I trademarked the concept in humans, prey drive. I then kind of developed my own theory of motivation. There's about 20 theories of motivation out there. They all basically say the same thing. We move toward things we want. When we're hungry, we move toward food. When we're thirsty, we move toward water. When we're lonely, we move toward people. But what happens when you have everything you want? You become satisfied and satisfied needs never motivate only unsatisfied needs. So what I started doing is I began to deconstruct these motivations of theory. And I go, I've been coaching for 33 years. I believe humans to have a prey drive, but that drive must be activated. Number one, there must be a persistence to that drive. And there must be an intensity to that drive. And then I went into the book, Flip the Switch, to actually codify the five activators of that drive uh, based on 33 years of coaching people from young adults to adults, right, of all walks of life, all socioeconomic backgrounds. And that really was my theory of motivation. And, and you know, as Grant called that, Vujia Day, I really brought a fresh perspective to an old way of thinking with the concept of prey drive. It's, it's another form of motivation, but it's not just to move, like motivate means to move, inspire means to breathe life into. Prey drive is really activating an instinct inside of you to want a better life, to pursue something. And that's really what the book Flip the Switch is about. You know, I uh, I said in the very beginning of the introduction, the Empowered Podcast is about reminding people that the power to have and to be and to do is already inside of every single one of us. When I came across you and your work, what I loved about what you're doing uh, at such a high level is you reminding people that, hey, we've got it inside of us. We don't need outside motivation. We don't need somebody that is this external force moving us along. We can activate that within ourselves. And so there are so many coaches out in the world today that wants to be the solution. They want to be the one that continues to move people forward. And you're reminding people that you can do it yourself. You've got it. This is how you use it. This is how you activate it. So for the benefit of our audience that have not yet read your book, could you give us some steps of where would you recommend we begin if we're wanting to identify that we have the prey drive and then how could we put that into practice, if, you know, maybe in our personal life or and or in a business? Well, think about states of energy as dynamic and that would be alive, vibrant, curious, hungry. Then there would be static, which would be complacent, bored, stuck in a rut. Then there would be entropic, which would be disintegrating. You know, so think of it like uh, like an airplane has an attitude indicator, which says the airplane is either ascending, it is plateaued, or it is descending. And when you think about a lot of people, what happened is at a time in their life, number one, a lot of people, their prey drive has never been activated. It's never, it's literally never been activated. So it's like a birthday gift that's never been opened. And so I see a lot of people that, you know, may watch my stuff and go, boom, you know, that activated something inside of me. Then I see some people that it's gone dormant. It's latent. It's undeveloped. At one time they had it in their life, but they lost it. They may think they're in a mechanical mode or a burnout mode. And then there is just people who have just given up, right? They've given up hope on a bigger future. Life has knocked the shout out of them, as my buddy Tim Story says, and they're just kind of out, right? They And they really need that drive to be reactivated. So it's interesting because I'm a coach when I'm coaching, 
you know, there's something about the way I deliver the cadence and the rhythm and the intensity that people will go, boom, man, something you said, I don't even know how to explain it, reactivated something inside of me to want to get back in the game, to want to go into battle again, to want to fight the good fight. So, so I look at it like there's phases, right? Activation, persistence, intensity. Those would be called phases of prey drive. But then there's also activators. So fear is an activator. Could be fear of loss. Could be a primary activator for most people. Competition could be an activator of prey drive. Exposure. I was in Chicago speaking this week, and I don't know how if you're in downtown Chicago and the river's running through the city and the buildings and the architecture, I don't know how you couldn't be activated, right? It's like, like boom, let's go. And then uh, environment is an activator of prey drive. So I'm around things. Uh, I, that's why I built a greatness factory in Nashville. And, you know, the founder of Orange Theory, one of the founders of Orange Theory is in my coaching program. And you know, he's really interested in this greatness factory because they scaled Orange Theory to like 2,000 locations. And he's like, man, I want to take this greatness factory around the world. And and I said, well, explain it to me. You know, explain the greatness factory to me. And he said, I don't know how to explain it. I just know that I feel great when I'm there. <laughs> and I go, okay, that is environment, right? Environment makes you want to play up. And then the ultimate one, uh, the last one would be embarrassment. When we are embarrassed by something, we sometimes activate the drive because of poor performance. We're not, we're not playing up to our level of potential. We're embarrassed by where we are in life. And that embarrassment can activate a drive to go, that's it. I'm tired of being at the bottom. I'm tired of living this life. I'm tired of playing it. I'm ready to go pro. And those will be the five activators of that drive. So if somebody was listening to this right now and everything that we're saying right now makes logical sense, but they don't know where to start, what would be your first bit of advice to support somebody in activating their prey drive? I think, I think really, if you go back to it, all activation starts with exposure. I mean, it's like I've seen something. I've been open to something. I remember going back to when I was 18 years old. I was a, a basketball coach, and I went to see this great coach. And, man, the way he ran practices, the way he ran that program, I'm like, that's what I want to do. That activated something inside of me. I want every player to have a notebook. I'm going to teach the seven habits of highly effective people. We're going to teach the good to great, right? This is to high school kids. And then he said, if you don't read another book this year, pick up Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And uh, I had never read a book like that. I went to the bookstore. I read it. It's relatively difficult to read for an 18-year-old. Uh, and I went back and read it again and I read it again. And then I'm like, boom, this is my guy. So for that next eight years, I just studied Covey and, and everything I could, which was one of the best things, but it activated something inside of me. And at 31 years old, Rudy, I put on a board after I retired from coaching one goal. And that one goal was to become the next Covey, you know, to become the modern day Covey. And uh, I got on an airplane once with Tim Story. We were just starting to do events together. And I had never told anybody that, Rudy, what I just told you. I never told anybody that was my one of my goals. And I get on this airplane. We're flying on a private plane. And uh, Tim Story looked at me and he said, you know, I've been meaning to tell you something. And I said, sure, what is it? And he said, man, I think you're the modern day Covey. <laughs> and I thought, that is crazy. Like, did you just say that? And he said, yeah. He said, I've been thinking. I've been meaning to tell you that for a while. And I thought it was just the coolest thing in the world. Now, I haven't sold 30 million copies of my book. And Dr. Covey was, you know, uh, did some major things in the world I would love to emulate. But but the fact that he said that was a, was a nice compliment. You know, I, I knew that he had said that. I didn't know it was on the plane. Uh, but I have read uh, that he had hailed you as the modern day Covey. And I was going to bring that up when you were referencing at 18 reading his book. And I was going to bring that into the audience as a reminder of the importance and the value of having expanders. So something that we speak about a lot, like I talk about this all the time, and that is the value and the importance of having somebody that is an expander in your life that shows you what's possible for you. We all know human behavior that if you want to have, be, do, or achieve something, you're only ever going to achieve it if you know that it's possible and then if you know that it's possible for you. And either one of those two is what throws us off. We don't believe we can do it or we don't believe that it is in fact possible. Well, I would like to share a story with you, if you don't mind, because you've been an expander for me on the topic. And uh, I think I may have mentioned it briefly to you in our first conversation a couple months back. But, you know, I was watching a video of yours one day on social media, and you were talking about being home every single night at seven o'clock to have dinner with your family, and that you bought a jet and that you fly private so that you can be home so that you're not waiting in line, you're not waiting for delayed planes. 
And something shifted in me because in that moment, I realized I need to get a plane. I'm not in a position at the time as, as of watching that. I was like, I'm not in a position to get a plane today, but now I know I need one. Now I'm going to get a private jet because I need to be able to be home every single night. And I spent so many weeks. I mean, I've done 20 speaking engagements just this year alone, and that excludes any companies that I've been in. And so if we just look at that over a course of weeks, how many nights I'm sitting in a hotel room, and I just wanted to thank you for that because you've given me something that has supported me in creating a new goal, a new vision, which has changed how I'm looking. And so I've activated my prey drive on that particular topic because I do value being home at dinner with my family and doing it every single night when possible. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Yeah. You know, you- yeah. Well, that, well, that's called, let me, let me, let me just say something on that. That's called a because goal. Uh, because goal is a big reason. See, Rudy, I grew up uh, without my dad. My dad wasn't there to put me in bed at night. He didn't come to baseball games. He, you know, so, so moments with me and my son, <clears throat> I almost get emotional just thinking about it, but you know, me being able to, me being able to see my son, I have two daughters and a son and me being able to put my son in the bed and re- read him a bedtime story. He do, he doesn't know how important that is to me, but I didn't have that as a kid. I didn't experience that. I didn't have a dad who put me in bed at night. I didn't have a be- a dad who, who woke up with me in the mornings and ate breakfast with me. So to me, uh, yes, I want to travel around the world. Yes, I had dreams before I had a family. But the truth is, the question started becoming, man, how could I get up and go to work if it was reasonable, see my kids in the morning, they could go to school, I could be home in the evening, and they didn't know where dad went. They didn't know if he drove or flew or wherever. And that was really the driving force behind the private jet was it wasn't for Instagram. I mean, I think it's nice that people see it on Instagram, but but it's really for a utility for me because... The because goal was I didn't have that as a kid. And I and I made up my mind that I was going to be a good dad to my kids because I didn't have that as a child. And it's no, no negative toward my father. Uh, he just didn't know how to be a, a good dad because he didn't have a role model in his life. And so it's like that's a because goal. And when you have a because goal, man, you lock into something. It's like whatever I got to do to make this happen, I am willing to do. So I'm glad I inspired you uh, to do that. But there's a deep reason I, I, I really got that. You know, I uh, I have my reasons too, and and it's all grounded around making sure that I give my kids a hundred percent of me. And uh, and and right now, when I'm traveling, obviously that's not the possibility. And so again, I thank you profusely for it. And I will share that jet photo with you one day uh, very soon. So for anyone that's listening to this, right? You hailed as America's coach. Um, you the modern day Kobe. You've created the greatness factory. You've published 20 books. You're moving all of these people, these companies, organizations forward, but you weren't always that way. I love to say that because so many people hear a podcast episode, they meet somebody and they think, wow, this person's phenomenal. They're brilliant. They must have just been born that way. And I love to remind people that we are always being prepared for the person that we get to become. I know that there was a story that you have publicly shared uh, of you sitting with your friend. The two of you were coaches. You were the coach of the women's basketball team. He was the coach of the men's team. You guys had just had a winning game. The two of you were licking your wounds, sitting on the back porch. And in that moment, you had this realization and you turned to him and you were like, man, would, would you, would you want to be a player for you? And he was like, definitely not. No, I wouldn't. And you were like, no, me either. And in that moment, you realized you weren't being the coach that you aspired to be. I would love it if you could start there because I think so many people talk about their tremendous successes, but they don't talk about what got them to the successes. And I think that's such a beautiful story of how you articulate taking where you were to get you to where you are today. Yeah, you know, the first, you know, you got to remember and, and for the audience, I became a head coach at 22 years old. So I was young. <clears throat> I was overconfident. Um, I thought I had a, had a chip on my shoulder. I wanted to prove to the world that I could do this. And man, I was extreme. And uh, I was motivated through fear a lot when I was a player. And I just thought that's how you motivate. You know, you mo- there's consequence based decisions. You motivate through fear. And that's how you control what's going on. And and uh, so for the first three years, I went 14 and uh, 13 and 16 my first year. That's 13 wins, 16 losses. Uh, then I came back and, and went 18 and 10. And then I came back and went 28 and three my third year. But I, I couldn't break through a ceiling. And uh, it was because the more intense I became, the more negative I became. And sitting on that uh, patio that night with my best friend, still my best friend to this day, 
He actually pays me to be his coach. Both of my best friends pay me to be their coach, which is a super cool thing. And um, I just said, man, would you like, I got a question for you. Would you enjoy playing for you? If you had to get, if you, could you get excited about coming to play for you? And he said, no, I think it would be miserable playing for me. And I said, you know, I wouldn't get excited playing for me. And that night, in that moment, I made a decision to, to become intense and positive. It was a big shift in my career. Okay. And I said, for this point forward, I'm going to be a person that people love to play for. I'm going to push them and I'm going to be intense very much like I am today, but I'm going to be positive. I'm going to be upbeat. I'm going to be Pete Carroll. I'm going to be the person that people go, man, I love playing for that dude. I want to work hard for that dude. And I made that decision that night to be intense and positive. And what happened over the next six or seven years was really remarkable because we went on to build a championship team and the players played so hard for me, but it was a shift that so many people never make. The more intense they become, the more negative they become. And the more pressure they have, the more negative they become. And I just decided that night something, I was just at a point, man, it's like, it's a breaking point. I'm going a different direction. And that really was a big, uh, it was a catalyst in my life. And it's something that I've kept to this day. You know, I can go negative just like other people. I am a very, you know, high D firstborn Leo. Uh, I can, I can be negative just like other people can, but I catch myself now. I've been coached by some of the best people in the world in how to uh, stay out of catastrophizing how to get into mental, uh, mental, from mental creation to physical action, how not to go to negative town. And we call it the sewer cycle versus the success cycle. And we want to stay in that success cycle. So the reason I asked you that question is because there are so many leaders out there right now that are either new leaders or the pressure's really on them based on just where we are in, in business today. And so they lead with tremendous amount of fear. And fear is a very, very powerful motivator but it's a very short-lived motivator. And you can only be motivated through fear, you know, for a very short period of time. If you say, if you don't do this, you're not going to be around, but people do motivate that way, or this is the expectation or else. And, you know, I see that come up so often where people are living, you know, a certain character when they're at work. And I would love to know what are you seeing and how easily can people shift from that? Because, we can be different people in different environments, but we're just so often the same person all the time because that's who we've always been. But it doesn't mean that's who we always have to be. Yep. Well, I run it, you know, a coaching business that has probably all in, I to say a couple thousand clients a month. And I see every side of human emotion. I see a lot of fear. I see people contracting. I see people that live in constant fear and worry and anxiety. I see people, you know, uh, obviously, want to be something, but not have the courage to move toward that something. So I kind of see everything, right? It's like, it's like, how do I get people from A where they currently are to B? And to use a Sullivan term, you know, that's why I love the four C's with Sullivan is you don't wait for the courage to come before you do something. You make a commitment and the commitment is followed up by the courage. The courage comes after the commitment. Then you learn a new skill and then you have a new confidence. Uh, but so, but so many people just stay where they are and they can't get out of that to get to the next level, then they start building an identity, right? And if you study the top habits of the top 1%, which I write about in the book, the Flip the Switch, most of those people have developed a very strong identity at some point in their life that cannot be broken by other people, cannot be broken by external factors. And it's like Dan Martell asked me when he, when I think he and I were doing a podcast a few weeks ago, I was telling him, man, the greatness factory has been a little scary for me because of how expensive it's been to build. And <clears throat> it just never seems to end. It's like, man, this is scary uh, because it's a big investment. And he said, go back to a time in your life when your back was against the wall that you didn't figure out a way to win. And I thought, now that's a good. He's like, when your back's against the wall, coach, you always find a way to win. And that's a, that's the thing you need to know. Well, that comes from identity. That comes from building that identity early in life, reinforcing that identity over three decades of knowing like, hey, there's pressure. And when there's pressure, there's nobody who can perform better under pressure than me, right? So it's like pressure is a privilege, Tim Grover. And it is a privilege because greatness needs an event. Like the only way for us to know people are great is there's gotta be an event that shows us. It's why we have Super Bowls. It's why we have NCAA championships. Well, in the business world, we need some event that shows us that you're great, that exposes how great you are. And that's what I think about. I see a lot of people under pressure. They just can't handle that pressure. So they contract they typically go back to something very comfortable in their life. And uh, it's, it's sad to me because people come work with me, Rudy, and they'll say, I want a better life and I want to go at a higher level. 
And then over a period of time, if they can't handle that, they almost always go back to something they told me they hated just for comfort. They go back to a job they hated. They go back to something they hated. And I'm like, man, come on. This, you came here because you wanted to level up. And it requires a new skill set to level up. And they typically go back to an old skill set. So you, you and I have had very similar journeys, obviously in different industries and different experiences. But when I was 21 years old, I was managing an organization and I had 60 employees. And uh, I had a tremendous amount of responsibility given to me when I wasn't prepared to have that level of responsibility. I didn't have the leadership skills. I didn't know how to, but I had a good heart. And so I showed up every single day with the intention of being the best I could be. And like you, I bring an intensity into every single room that I'm in. Well, I rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, thinking I was doing what I was supposed to do as the leader of the business. And I had this really embarrassing moment where the owner of the organization came in and sat me down in front of all of the employees, put a chair down and let them one by one go through and tell me what they didn't like about how I was showing up as a leader. And so when I left, I had a choice to make. I can quit, I can cry, or I can change. And so I had to change. And it became the most beautiful gift because it supported me in who I am today. I would love to know, what was it like for you leaving that porch that day with your best friend and realizing I have to create a change and I'm now going to walk in and I'm going to be intense, but I'm going to be positive. And how did you handle that transition? Because I think that's where so many people get stuck is they've been a certain way. They want to be somewhere else, but now what do they do to be able to create that shift? Yeah. Well, I was coaching with a guy that summer and in Tennessee, what they did is they put the top 12 players together. They called it the Nike team. It was sponsored by Nike. And then they hand selected the top five coaches who they thought were the best coaches in Tennessee. And so I was the head coach of that team probably three or four times. And I had this staff of assistants that were like the best people in the world. And, uh, and so one guy noticed he was real intense, but he was real positive. And I'm sitting there watching him coach, right? And he, I'm, so I'm exposed to this. And I'm like, man, the players respond really well to you. And he said, you know, who, who said you had to go negative when you got intense? And I thought, man, this is a decision I'm making. I'm working on doing this. So a lot of it came from me, Rudy, for modeling. I would model someone. I'd go, look how that guy responds. Look how he talks. Look at the language he uses. Look at the cadence of how he communicates with the players. He would say real positive things like, man, I love coaching you. Such an honor to work with you. You're one of the best players I've ever coached. And I was like, just the vernacular that this guy used was like that. I need, this is what I need to be doing. So I actually had a person track the positive versus negative um, contacts uh, that I had in a day. Like, like, like how many positive things did I say? How many negative things did I say? And it was like, you know, I kept a tally. And at the end of the day, it's like, Hey, you said 25 negative things and you said 50 positive things. So it's two to one ratio. And I'm like, okay, I need to keep improving on this to where it's three to one or it's four to one. And that's kind of how I brought a higher awareness to my positive versus negative because coaches are intense. They, they, they create tension. Like that's what one of the things they're really good at. And that's what causes a person to take action because sometimes where there's no pain, there's no change. And um, so I wanted to create that tension to, to want to be better, but I wanted to do it in a way they go, man, that dude loves me. You know, he really wants me to perform at a high level. He wants my best interest. And that's really what I shifted to. So what I want everybody that's listening to this episode to take from that, if they don't go back and re-listen to it, which I recommend, is that you took a level of accountability for your behavior at a high level that so many people would be very scared to do. Coach, what you did was you enrolled somebody on your team to hold you accountable to being that way and then to give you the data to show you how am I being black and white? Did I achieve my goal today? Yes or no? And so many people want to achieve something different, but they don't want somebody to tell them that they're doing good or they're not doing good. And I think that's the difference between creating that is when you can see the actual data. Now, I know that you've referenced being a positive leader to be somebody that's coming in with intensity, but also with kindness and compassion. You've mentioned Pete Carroll twice on the episode so far today, and he is a leader that has always led like that. Players always you know, talk about how he is is you know, uplifting, motivating, inspiring the leaders, but holds them to like the impossible standard, which is something that I love. But I know that you are a very intense uh, man. I know that you expect a tremendous amount from the people that work with you and that you're also now doing it with a tremendous amount of kindness and compassion. I've heard you mention that at midnight, every single night, it goes back to zero. I would love for you to speak into what does that mean? Why do you manage your company or your team that way? 
And if somebody were to take that into their life, not even into their business, just into their life, what would be the change that they would see? Well, the concept of it all goes to zero at midnight um, is a concept that, that every day we start over. Today doesn't care about yesterday in a lot of ways. It's like, okay, you had a great day yesterday. We go to bed tired. We wake up hungry. It all goes to zero at midnight because so many people, when I wrote Flip the Switch, I was really trying to solve a problem of, of complacency and consistency. So many people go, well, I had a good day yesterday or last week, or I have passive income. And what they do is they just kind of let it go, right? And they don't go into battle every day. And I learned from being a coach that you just couldn't do that. You couldn't, you couldn't win on Tuesday and get lazy on Wednesday and Thursday and, and win on Friday. It just didn't work that way. It's like there's always, you know, I always said there always comes a time when winter is asking what you've been doing all spring and summer. And winter's always coming. Right. Just look at look at the United States and the economic cycles every 10 years where there's prosperity. Then there's dark times then there's winter and then it's hard. And it's like it's like, man, we got to go to bed tired and wake up hungry. And that is something that people lose in their life. They go to bed tired and they wake up complacent, which is a gradual settling to a place of mediocrity. They just don't have a standard of excellence. And it's like somebody's got to come in and go, look, we don't do that. We, we go to bed tired and we wake up hungry because it all goes to zero. I mean, so it's something you tell the brain and it kind of changes the way you attack a day, right? It's like, we got a fresh day. Let's be grateful, but let's go get it again today. No matter what we did yesterday, let's go get it. So that's why I like daily goals versus uh, monthly. I think if you hit your daily goals every day, then you add that up and you're going to hit your monthly. You're going to hit your quarterly. You're going to hit your yearly. And very few people have daily goals. They have monthly, quarterly, yearly. And I'm like, no, we start at zero. And we're trying to get to this number every day. So, so you take it to a completely different level. And I would love for you to speak into that a little bit as well, because I'm already aware that you say daily goals, but your team have to report to you on a Sunday night, what their intention is for that week. And then when they start working that day, you have to know what they're committed to that day. And halfway through the day, they've got to do a check-in to say, I am you know, getting there or I'm, I'm not close to that yet so that they can pivot within their day. So many people in life and or in business, they set a big goal, but they don't measure the micro steps that I have to get them there. And then six months or eight months later, they realize, wow, we're really far off the mark. And now they've got to pivot to create the shift or the change. But with you managing your people so closely to that expectation, what is the pressure that they are under? And obviously it's working because you're extremely successful. Your business continues to grow and to accelerate. You're driving profound results in the lives of your clients. But what would it would you speak into if somebody's hearing this and they want to now start to hold their people to more goals more often? What what do you see as the problem that comes up from your team? Well, the first problem is going to come is going to be resistance uh, from from people because the context needs to be set. I'm not uh, holding my team accountable to babysit them. I'm actually teaching them the habits of the top one percent of performers. And two of the habits of the top 1% is grit and resilience and um, the ability to lock in and see something through to its conclusion. And so uh, when I first started this, one of my team members said, I know you do this. I know you spend hours planning your week. I know you prepare like an animal. I know you do this. And he said, now, why should we have to do it? And I said, well, I mean, you know, you're not doing it for me. You're doing it for you. This is a habit of the top people in the world. They plan their weeks out. They have daily accountability. They check in with their teammates. And it's not a check in like I'm, I'm standing over you like a big brother. It's literally like, hey, man, who's working what? What kind of success are you having? Let's celebrate with you. But it's kind of a cadence and a rhythm of just checkpoints throughout the day to make sure people are in the right mental space, the, you know, the, right, the right toughness space. And they're like really pursuing their goals. So what I'm really doing is teaching people the habits of the top performers and for people who want to work with me, they just got to have those habits or it's not going to work, right? It's like, well, I don't want that pressure. Well, then you probably don't need to work with Coach Burke. You probably need to work somewhere, probably need to work over at the complacency factory versus the greatness factory. Because at the greatness factory, we have a higher expectation than other people do. And that's the kind of people I'm looking for. So I knew your answer would be along those lines. And I wanted to play devil's advocate for the audience because they're hearing this intensity and the pressure. And immediately so many people would be like, wow, that must be really hard to, to work in an environment where you're being held to that expectation. 
And I wanted to point out that it's not micromanaging. What you're doing is showing what's possible. You know, I have a, a billionaire client and I support the organization and their team called me one day and a bunch of the leaders and they say, man, you know, they're just never happy with anything. You know, it doesn't matter what we do. The boss is like, it's not enough. We need more. You've got to drive more. It's got to be more. It doesn't matter how much growth we have. And they were very frustrated and saying like, I don't know if I can work under this pressure. And so I started laughing and I said, you're missing the point. And they were like, well, what do you mean? What do you know that I don't know? Because this is not funny. And I'm like, what is he teaching you right now by holding you to a standard that even though you've doubled or tripled the business, his expectation is there's still more. Where can we grow more? What can we do? How can we continue to expand? And after the end of that conversation, everyone in that room realized that he was demonstrating to them how he got to where he got to. And he was teaching them the skill of saying, okay, we've done really well. We've achieved this result. And in using your terminology, at midnight, everything goes back to zero. Now we've done that. That's amazing. Now what are we going to do and where do we go next? And I wanted everybody to be able to hear that and to hear that from you. So thank you. I, uh, I know that you are a phenomenal coach. Uh, you've spoken into it, obviously, throughout the episode. But you also are a phenomenal father. And so for anybody that's listening to this, because I get a lot of questions where people say to me, oh, I'm a new dad or a new mom. How do I raise my kids in the same disciplines or principles that you know I'm applying into their lives or into their businesses? And so I know that you have a unique way of communicating with your children, and you call it building identity. And I would love for you to introduce that to our audience. Well, I think identity is is built very early in life, you know, and I and I am an example of that. My mother, uh, although she was just 16 years old when she had me, she always spoke to me as if I was an adult. She always treated me like I was an adult. She all she she kind of conditioned me from an early age. We don't whine. We don't complain. We don't make excuses. We show up, we grow up and we deliver. And that was the conditioning I had as a child. So when I go back and people say, you know, how did you turn out like this? You know, what happened to you? And, and it was because of really the, the, uh, you know, the, the scripting that I had early in my life, the environmental scripting that I was around from both coaches and my mother. And so when I had children, you know, it's like my firstborn uh, daughter is, is very strong willed. And, you know, I think a lot of what she sees from us is we show up every day. We do what we said we're going to do. We believe in ex excellence. And I watch her absorb. I take a lot of notes, right? And I'm sitting by my daughter at one of my conferences and she's taking pages and pages of notes, you know, when she's 10 years old. And some of the things she's observing, just observing how we operate every day. <clears throat> and some of the things it's like, no, we don't do that. We don't talk about other people. We don't participate in drama. We don't like, right? That's us. That's not us. And what I'm trying to do is teach her not between stimulus and response is a space. And in that space lies your ability to choose your response. And I said, some people are not going to like you because you're Coach Bert's dad or, or Coach Bert's daughter or, you know, or, or you, you fly on a private jet with, you, with your dad or whatever. I said, you're going to have to be tough and you're going to have to understand that sometimes in life people are going to treat you a certain way. The more games I won as a basketball coach, the more negative people were to me. <laughs> and it's like, you know, at the grocery store, they were rude. And here, so it's like I'm trying to teach them and condition them to be tough enough to handle what happens to them in the world and be tough enough to pursue big things because you're going to meet a lot of resistance when you do big things. You know, I, I love that you, you speak into building identity. Um, my wife is using a very similar practice that she – picked up, I'm assuming from a book because she's an avid reader. And I've mentioned on the podcast before, but she's constantly reevaluating her identity. And she says, I don't do that anymore. Or she says, we don't do that anymore. But she's speaking to herself. And so she could be opening up the fridge, grabbing milk, and then she has a thought and then she goes, "Uh, -uh we don't do that anymore. And in that moment, what she's doing is she's having a thought and she's caught herself thinking something, whether it was a limiting belief or, you know, judgment or something about someone or what somebody else is doing. And then in that moment, she realizes, oh, no, we don't do that anymore. And then she'll actually make the statement out aloud and then redefine who does she want to be and how does she want to show up. And I think that that is such an incredible gift. I love that you teach your children that way. You know, and so from such a young age, they're learning the disciplines of how to be leaders, because ultimately, that's what you're teaching is self-leadership. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think identity, a lot of self-talk, you know, people ask me what my self-talk is in the morning and it's, you know, my positive energy is going to be greater than any negative energy I face today. I am a person of interest. People are counting on me to show up, to grow up and deliver. Amateurs listen to their feelings. Professionals do not listen to their feelings. You know, there's a, there's a self-talk that I use 
because after 33 years of doing this, right, I face the same thing other people do. It's like, what activates my prey drive? What is the next level 10 opportunity for me? What is the big blue Marlin relationships that I need to be working? Like what reactivates that drive after three decades of going at a pretty hard pace, you know, for, for the first 13 years, for sure, 18, uh, 80 hours a week, you know, seven days a week of trying to build a championship team. And uh, people ask me what's different about my new role. And it's like, well, I get to choose which 80 hours I work. <laughs> That's the difference between my old gig and the new gig. I get to choose. Oh my gosh. I love that. So I want to pivot ever so slightly because you are the creator of the greatness factory. And so I want to ask you, you know, why did you name it the greatness factory? Because it ensues that, that you are going to be able to take somebody and make them great through those doors. So my question really is, do you believe that everyone has the power or the potential to be great? I think that, that people have the seeds of greatness in them in their own way. I think they have to be awakened to that. I think, I think eight to 10 people can't tell me what their talents are, what their primary skills are. They've never been in situations to be educated and, and really grown as people. But I do think that the concept came from uh, parents bringing me their kids at 14 years old and said their daughter had potential. And I would say, thank you for bringing your daughter to the greatness factory where we are going to manufacture her greatness. And I would spend on average five and a half hours a day uh, daily with those kids. And we mentally uh, produce great people, winners. I mean, we went to work on the body, the mind, the heart and the spirit. It was just very advanced in those days and very intentional. And sure enough, four years later, man, these kids could do anything. When we were finished with them, they literally could do anything. And I thought, okay, why don't I build something like that for adults? Where does an adult go? If you're in Nashville, Tennessee, where, you know, kind of where I live, where do you go when you want to be great? What do you go do? You know, there's really nowhere to go. You go to a conference, you go to a workshop, you go to this, but like, what if you could work at a place that, you know, curated excellence? What if you could work at a place where other people wanted to be, be great? What if you could work at a place where you got access to coaching and environments and uh, monthly events and it stimulated you to really pursue your greatness? And that's really why I built the Greatness Factory of Nashville. So for somebody that is in the Nashville area or is looking to up-level their life, what would they gain by coming to visit? How does it work? Could you speak into a little bit? Because I know that this has been a tremendous investment, over $7 million to put this together. You've got 109 seats. It's an incredible custom-built auditorium. Uh, but how would we utilize it? Well, today I did, you know, if you're a member, the membership start at 500 a month. They can work in the co-working space, but every member gets access to coaching. So they get into my weekly coaching programs. Uh, today, I did a go to bed tired, wake up hungry sales rally. So every member gets access to my coaching. They get to come to my one day boot camps at no cost as part of their membership. So there's co-working, co-working with coaching. That is really the separator between our place and all of these other places. So, so then it moves up to private suites or private offices. Those are called members. Those members get access to the amenities like the theater, the podcast studio, the dream foundry, the money lab. Uh, so there are private offices for rent on level two, and then you go up to level three and you have 109 person state of the art theater. You've got uh, state of the art podcast studio. You've got really cool rooms to meet money lab, the dream foundry. That, that's all rentable space for people on the outside of the greatness factory, but also members get to enjoy the benefits of being members there, either at discounted rates for those amenities, or all they have to do is pay for the engineers or the technicians, you know, to be able to use my theater, which we typically rent between 10 and 20,000 a day, you know, all you have to do is pay the, pay the engineering fee to be able to use the theater if you're a member there and you're on level two. And uh, so it's, I think it's a really cool place to, to work, to learn, to grow and to connect. I love it because, you know, you're speaking into who you are about creating the right environment for where you can achieve greatness. And I want to just touch on because I pay attention to micro information. And I'd asked you a question. If do you believe that people all have the ability to be great? And your response was you connect and support people to achieve their greatness. And that was the genius that lies in the answer. Because I do believe we all have our own level of greatness, our highest and our greatest potential. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of people that are business leaders that listen to the podcast, not everybody, but we have a lot of business leaders. And I want to just touch on a topic that I've overheard you speak about a number of times. And that is that, 
you know, in sports, so many people would work on a defensive plan and you came out as a coach, which what made you a winning coach is to come out and to create an offensive strategy that crippled your competition. And that was the terminology that you use. Like you actually scared the daylights out of them as you came out of the gates. And now you've been able to take that logic and apply it into business. But for anybody that's listening to the episode, as I turn it over to you, coach, I don't want people to listen to this only in the context of business because we can also have an offensive strategy in our life and, and attack life as opposed to you know defend what's happening and living a default life. So could you speak into a little bit about what would it look like to pivot from defense into an offensive you know, business and or lifestyle? Well, it's really to go from you know mental creation to physical action and to create, to see yourself as a person who can create create opportunity, create leads, create partnerships, create, uh, you know, whatever it is you want to create. So offense is getting up every day and being intentional, right? It's, it's getting up every day and playing the game. Like this is why I have a selling system. This is why we generate leads. This is why we follow up like we do. This is why we work the system because what we're trying to do is create, create opportunity, create strategic partnership. And I think so many people wake up and they play a defensive posture. And I always say defense is never won championships, right? Offense wins championships. Uh, and a lot of people think, well, I need to play defense. There is risk. There is um, a risk mitigation. There are times in life where we have to protect our, our, our hedge, our risk. But at the, at the same time, so many people wake up and just go at a, a nominal pace. And that's not playing offense. It's like we're going to set aggressive targets. We're going to pursue those targets. We're going to learn how to get down to the daily activation of that prey drive. We're going to practice what we preach, and we're going to go out and create. We're going to show people that they can do it. And I think a lot of people just don't know how to do that, right? A lot of the books that I write, whether it be Million Dollar Follow-Up or From A to B or Flip the Switch, it's, it's really teaching a person how to create and play offense versus sit in a defensive posture and just wait on things to happen. Uh, I say, you know, Newton's law, objects at rest, stay at rest unless acted on by an outside force. Right. And that's why, you know, it's why I believe in follow up. It's why I believe in going the distance. It's why I believe in a lot of the things that I do is, is, is pure creation. And, you know, I want to bring the audience in a little further because at the level that you were already at in your life and your business, you still do the follow up. You still take the calls. You're still in the hustle or the grind of the day to day of your business leading by example. And I think that that's another facet that is so often missed in parenting or in personal lives and or in business is that we get to a point where we get complacent and we stop doing it, but we still have the expectation that everybody else should be doing it to that standard. Coach, you have brought so much value. I pr probably talk your ear off for the next 10 hours if I was given the opportunity to do so. But I would love to just ask you if, uh, you know, I actually like to ask on the episode, what is a great book that you've read that changed your life? And then I get you to share that. But I instead want to ask you out of the 20 books, you've mentioned Flip the Switch three times or four times in this episode alone. But I would love to know if there was somebody that has learned about you today for the very first time, they haven't read one of your books, what would be the book that you would recommend that is either your favorite or the one that has created the most shifts in people's lives where they could start? Yeah, I, I think it would be Flip the Switch. A lot of people do like Person of Interest, which is a smaller book that I wrote. Um, Everybody Needs a Coach in Life was one of my favorites. Uh, the new one I have out on my website is called The Making of a Coach, which is kind of the business side of coaching. Uh, but I think what I do is I write books on big subjects that solve real problems. And, uh, you know, when people were going through transition in life, the little book I wrote called Swag, uh, really helped a lot of people through transition, whether it be divorce or the loss of something to get their confidence back. So it's like, here's a big problem. I'm going to write a book to solve the problem based on my unique past. And uh, But Flip the Switch encompasses the best of Coach Burt. It really is the, the best of everything that I've written. So coach, we're going to put your email, uh, web, beg your pardon, your website, your you know Instagram handles, everything into the show notes. But if somebody was wanting to find you, where would be the best place you would recommend to get in touch? I'd go straight to coachbert.com and you know, it says, says connect with me on there or Instagram popular there, YouTube, coach Michael Burt, TikTok, anywhere, just search coach Michael Burt. And uh, we put out a lot of content. So I would go to coachbird.com or just message me on DM and say, man, I saw you on the podcast. Love to do something with you. So I would love to close today's episode uh, by just asking you one final question. You're on the Empowered Life podcast where we're speaking into you have the power that lies within to achieve your highest and your greatest potential. And I would love to ask you, what does it mean to you 
when you hear the words live an empowered life? I think it is. It really comes back to activation. I think empowering is um, unleashing something inside of another person. You know, one of my favorite definitions of leadership was affirming and validating the worth and potential in another person in so clear a way they begin to see it in their own self. And I think empowering is really affirming and validating another person's worth and potential in so clear a way that they go, man, I could do this, right? As a transfer there of confidence and conviction. And to me, that is what empowering really means at the end of the day. 